Well, Jim was many different things at different times. I think in the last couple of years, when I was studying with him for my DMA, I, I don't know, I found him to be sort of a mix between a, a mentor, a colleague, and a teacher, and in the end, kind of a father figure, really. He always used to joke about, joke about how uh, he wanted to ask my parents if, if he could adopt me. He said he, always, he wanted me to be his kid, and uh, I don't know, it was always really funny to me, but it always made me feel, uh, you know, really good. That I felt like we had something in common, our mutual obsession over all of these little facets of guitar and lute and new music and old music, working with composers and looking at old scores. And I don't know, we were, he was a total nerd and so am I, and I don't know, I felt like we could just be on the same level. And uh, so he was sort of like, if you, if you had a dad that you just shared all your same interests, you know. And no, I don't know if any parent or child relationship is like that, but if there could be one, it would be sort of like my relationship with Jim. Jim Smith was my dear, dear friend, my esteemed colleague. He was a man that shared the same passion that I do for our beloved guitar and for our deep love that is music. We loved each other and uh, he was a very knowledgeable man but beyond his knowledge was the depth in which, with which he felt music, the way that music united his spirit with his knowledge and he lived with music and music helped to take him to the other world. I think he was an exemplary teacher. He loved his pupils and he loved his teachers. He was the perfect link in the chain that goes from teacher, student, and then that student becomes the teacher. And so he was always looking into the future with a, with a very grateful um, attitude and feeling for the past. He was a beautiful man, a beautiful father. And he was a man who felt the love of music and its incredible gift that it offers us. And he took that into the way he felt about his friends, about his family, his children, and about his fellow man. Jim was a good man. Well, one, uh, one thing, you know, he was such a great sight reader, you know, and so I remember thinking, and he would always just get me really that I should write more music, and so I said, well, you know, I finally published my music, and, and this was at a period when I decided to publish a couple of my pieces. So I brought him to him, and I was so proud of it, it looked great, and I'm sure there was no mistakes, because, you know, he was such a... He could he could sight read and just he, see anything, and he, and he also knew my pieces. So he he opens it up, and on the first I think the first measure of the first piece, he says, "There's a mistake right here, right here." And I said, "I just sank." I said, "Oh, this bastard! I can't believe this! I can't believe he found a mistake. This is unbelievable!" And and there it was. It was like there, you know. So it's just crazy. I was so happy to show him this thing that I thought was so perfect and right from the beginning. Says, well, this chord's clearly wrong. And he was like, "Ah!" But you know, luckily there. I remember I was uh, trying to catch the elevator to go upstairs, like three floors, and um, I was actually there with my father. And and even though Jim's older than my father, Jim
Jim came running behind us and, um, you know, going to the same class and said, come on guys, let's go to the staircase. And we just used the stairs and he just sprinted up the stairs. And <laughs> I just remember standing there just laughing because my dad would not do it. <laughs> And there was Jim just sprinting up three floors like nothing. Um, also, what can I say? I think his uh, his train of thought. Um, anyone that were in his classes remembers that he had a consistent train of thought that was hard to uh, to well basically to keep track of. So whenever he was assigning homeworks, uh, he would start talking about the homework and then go on to something else, go on to something else, go on to something else. And then by the end of it, class was over and everyone was just sitting around saying, okay, what's the homework? <laughs> so those are just several of the memories that I always amused me about the gym. When I was uh, a sophomore, I had done a summer camp teaching guitar and I uh, roomed with three clowns from Barnum and Bailey Circus over the summer and learned a little bit about clowning. And uh, when I came back, I told Jim about this, and he said, Oh, my, my daughter Adrian is having her birthday party, and uh, can you be a clown for her birthday party? And so, um, and when Jim would ask a question like that, it, it's kind of hard to say no, because he's so enthusiastic and, and, and bubbly and, and enthusiastic. And so, sure enough, uh, it happened to be the day that I played in my very first competition. It was a little uh, American String Teachers competition here. I performed and left before they announced the uh, the, fun, the results because I had to go put clown makeup and a, and a nose and big fuzzy hair and big floppy shoes on and juggle for his daughter's uh, birthday party when she was three years old. Uh, so that that kind of I think encapsulates the, the kind of the dual sides of Jim for me. Like the, he helped me prepare for the serious uh, competition coached me on it, and then encouraged me to be a clown. I don't know if it's pr just profound or just freakish, but there was a time when we were going over my arrangement of the World Timber Clavier that I did for Guitar Quartet, and I had the parts, but I didn't bring in a score, uh, and we were looking at a five-part fugue, the C-sharp minor fugue, and uh, there was only the two of us, and Jim wanted to hear more of what was going on, so he laid out uh, the other four parts, all on two music stands next to each other, and I was playing my the part that I play in my ensemble, and he was playing all the other parts simultaneously, not even from score, which I already would be hard enough, but from the parts, basically scanning back and forth across a like this wide range and layering the uh, the other four voices all together. It was pretty amazing. I don't know how anybody could do that. It was one of a kind. And um, the other thing I used to get into, you know, he was so, uh, like, loved to, uh, to, to, you know, whatever you said, he listened attentively, and if he, if he disagreed, he was up for an argument, so he loved to argue, and we used to have the best arguments, I mean, not, not malicious at all, but, but we, well, we would get into it, but, but just for the sake of really, you know, making you think about what you said, you know, he really wanted you to think about what you said, so when you said something that he thought you were thinking about, then he'd come at you with, well, what do you mean by that? And you, you can't really mean that, do you? You don't believe that, do you? Um, so I used to love that about him, you know, and I remember when in particular in Manhattan at this Italian restaurant, I swear to God, we were screaming, yelling about, I think, high art and low art, and what does Madonna mean, and as opposed to the Bach, and you can't compare these two, and, how, you know, just great, it was so that I loved it. I guess... I was struck when Ben uh, Verdery was talking about uh, his obsession with notes and what note was correct. And, and uh, uh, I can just remember uh, uh, getting to this point of agreeing to disagree on uh, this note in the Villalobos uh, Fifth Prelude toward the end. There's a sequential passage, and he uh, he loved that the note sort of more diatonic, and I loved the note more clearly sequential. And, we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and he always reveled in the idea that it was uh, it was the, that way in the score uh, that was always published, the Max Eschig score. And then, as you know, fairly recently they found these other manuscripts, and the other manuscripts turned out my note was the note that was there. And so, after all that happened, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, he had, uh, you know, uh, sort of valued the, the score as being, you know, the, the urtex, and you've got to just abide by that, and why am I changing? Once he found that other note there, he said, well, you know, it doesn't make any sense to be that way, and you, you, you know, you, you got to realize that oftentimes mistakes are made, so, you know, that's the wrong note, and, and my note's correct, so he, he, he was always so good at taking uh, <laughs> whatever side of the argument was was most uh, you know oppositional, and uh, I always uh, remember that I saw uh, one of my old friends, Edmund Ford Levine, the great singer, uh, who Jim had put us together early on, and uh, when I came to USC, and Edmund always loved that piece, and uh, so we were talking about that last night, and I'll always think about that note, what note to play right at that moment, and uh, probably start playing Jim's Jim's note for. There are deep moments, there are comical moments. Uh, I was always, and will always ever be, completely astounded by his ability to sight read anything. Um, in our lessons, he used to review new music for Soundboard Magazine. And so he'd always bring in a stack of music um, that he had to read through. So we'd read it together, and some things were for guitar and you know, two guitars, guitar, violin, but some things were for guitar and wind quintet, guitar, tuba, and euphonium, and harp, and all these really strange combinations. And it, I can remember it as if it were yesterday, where he, you know, I would, he would have me read the guitar part, which was hard enough, but he would read everything else. And to me, being a guitarist who, and I was never a bad sight reader, but that just impressed me so much that a guitar player could do that. Um, and, and to, you know, to this day, he set a, a, a high uh, standard for guitarists being able to sight read well. And uh, you know, I honestly I have nothing but but just great memories. Jim was a guy who really, I mean, I mean, he was a big, you know, a big person. Like he really took big chunks out of his life, out of life. And um, not only musically, with you know, amazing capacity for work and for uh, you know arranging, performing, and, you know, gigging, and doing concerts and pop music and classical music and avant-garde music, but also uh, you know he was a really avid sort of outdoorsman. I mean, especially like hiking, and he would go on. Uh, he started hiking in Griffith Park back in I think back in the 90s is when he really got into it. I went up a couple times with him. He was always trying to recruit people to go out with him, but they were, you know, like, it's like being in the Marines or something like that. So I, I you know, I wasn't really <laughs> always up for it because he, he set quite a pace. But I took a few of those hikes with him, and uh, that's one memory I have of Jim, sort of outside of music. We loved and play um, Morton Loris and Sudir uh, which he arranged it. And every time he played that, um, uh, when he had a music together, it was always a um, very, very special feeling. Because I, sometimes um, um, he, he said, you know, hey, Sang Young, you know, I, I, I feel really overwhelmed and I feel so happy, and makes you, your voice makes me goosebumps. You know, and, same way, I think. And we had um, some, not just guitar and soprano, but we had a concert with uh, some other chamber music, the violin, the cello, and flute, and some other instruments. And it was a great moment all together. I, I cannot just pick one or two. Every moment was special for us. Yeah.